this year, 2022, has not been my best year for reading classics by any stretch. It's been a real struggle and I've had no desire to read classics, which usually are my favourite thing to read, up until this point of the year. And I think that my recent return to reading classics has felt a little bit like coming home again, opening the door into a world that feels so familiar and comfortable, and it's almost like I've never been been away. But at the same time, the books that I've chosen to read recently, the ones that grabbed my attention, have all been slightly different to what I would typically read. So alongside some old favourite authors, I've also tried to broaden my horizons and I've tried some new genres, new authors and new styles. So I'm looking forward to sharing them with you. These are all the classics I have read recently. One of my very favourite authors who I discovered a few years ago is Edith Wharton. She was writing at the turn of the 20th century and her books are mainly set during the Gilded Age and she has been known on many occasions to make me cry like a baby because she seems to be able to find the emotional heart of her reader and really hit you where it hurts. I've read quite a few of her books now like The Age of Innocence, The House of Mirth and Ethan Frome and the most recent Edith Wharton book I decided to read was the glimpses of the moon. This isn't one of her more popular books and it came at a quite interesting point in her career because even though she wrote it before she wrote The Age of Innocence, which was perhaps her biggest work because she won the Pulitzer Prize with it, it was published after The Age of Innocence and so many readers and critics viewed this book unfavourably because it couldn't quite compare to the heights of The Age of Innocence. I, however, really enjoyed this. This is about Susie and Nick who are living in New York and they're living in very privileged circles but neither are wealthy themselves. They are hangers-on. So Susie has quite a lot of wealthy friends who she will live with, who she'll take favours from, who she's very happy to take jewels and gifts from, and Nick has very much attached himself to a nouveau riche family who um, he has travelled around with quite a bit, and both of them agree to marry and then live off the profits of their wedding gifts, the honeymoon offers, the monetary checks that they receive, and they agree to remain married until there's no more money left, uh, which really highlights how fashionable divorce was becoming at the time that the book is set and when it was published. Divorce wasn't really seen as this super sordid thing amongst the upper classes, which is something that Edith Wharton points out in the book, which is very different from a lot of the usual Victorian classics I read. Something like Thomas Hardy, for example, where marriage is seen as the ultimate tie, something you can't escape from. This, in comparison, is very frivolous. Um, and I loved this glimpse at this world that our characters are inhabiting, but they are slightly on the edges of. It's set in Europe, so whilst we get to see lots of New York in Edith Wharton's other novels, I loved the change of setting in this one, getting to see Italy, Paris, London, um, and I loved the way that Edith Wharton characterised them. I will say that I loved Susie a lot more than I liked Nick, and despite the fact that they are together, that there is a supposed love story going on, the characters are apart for a lot of the book, so I do expect that. It's got a slightly tragic line, but in terms of where this sits in relation to Edith Wharton's other novels, this is certainly one of the happier of her books. And in fact, I was quite disappointed by that. I think I go into an Edith Wharton novel expecting to be punched in the gut, to have my heart ripped out of my chest, because... I want that when I read one of her books. I want to feel like my heart is breaking alongside the character's hearts breaking. But I was disappointed in the ending because I feel like she takes the easy route and I've never known Edith Wharton to take the easy route before. And without spoiling any of Edith Wharton's books, usually there is some kind of tragic ending. That's almost a given with her stories. And that's what I wanted as a reader. But with this one, she just doesn't deliver the ending that I felt was 
most deserving for the characters. I felt like they actually deserved a grand finale, something that really stuck with me. And so whilst a lot of the book has stuck with me and that I will still think about and I would be happy to reread this, the ending I think lets it down because it isn't as powerful. Even if it wasn't tragic, I still think it could have had a really killer gut punch moment and it just didn't have that so that was slightly disappointing for me but I would still highly recommend this book it was so much fun to read and I just got swept away in it completely Edith Wharton is such a talent her writing I just could live in it like you can luxuriate in her writing she just had a real gift with words and so despite what's happening in the story I would read her books regardless go into the glimpse of the moon not expecting to like every single character or any of the characters but that's why you should read it. If you haven't read any Edith Wharton before, I'm not sure if this is the place I would tell you to start. Maybe start with something like The Age of Innocence instead, which has my whole heart. I still liked this, but I didn't quite love it as much. I have always said that crime and murder mystery novels are just not for me. They are not my thing and I never thought I would really get into them or would enjoy them. But recently I have had a change of heart and have started a little personal project to read some of the golden age crime detective novels. And the place I wanted to start was with Dorothy L Sayers and I read Whose Body, which is the first Lord Peter Whimsey novel. Lord Peter Whimsey is a character who is somewhat difficult to like. He's often seen as a caricature of himself or of the amateur detective. He is very much in the style of like Jeeves and Worcester and is a privileged and chaotic mess that's the best way I can describe him. But I actually really enjoyed reading about him. I loved him as a character. I loved the way that he was characterised. I think it is quite a particular taste. I don't think everybody would like him, but I knew going into it that that's what I was prepared to read and I kind of knew a little bit about him. And actually I found that as soon as I got into those first pages, I was there. I was living amongst his world and I loved how deeply I fell into it. Of course, we have to judge a crime novel on the crime itself. And I don't think that that is the strong point of this book, which is somewhat disappointing. I loved this book because I loved Lord Peter Whimsey, but the crime definitely let it down and I'm hoping that that improves as the series goes on. Mainly because the crime in this book is that a man is discovered in a bath dead, completely naked in this bath. He has somehow got there. It's not his house. Nobody knows how he has come to be lying dead in somebody else's house. And that's one crime that's going on. And there is another crime running alongside that where uh, somebody has gone missing. And the thing that connects these two mysteries is that both of the victims are Jewish and so there is some quite heavy anti-semitism in this book which is very uncomfortable at times. It made the book overly simplistic because there was no nuance to it and because it did fall into stereotypes quite often and regardless of Dorothy L. Sayers intention it didn't work. Fundamentally there were big issues with the way that that was. I know that a lot of crime written at this time falls into those tropes and conventions and that doesn't stand up to modern readership now but as a foundation to sit this crime, this mystery upon, it didn't work and that did make the reveal at the end quite obvious so I don't think it was the most complex of mystery novels but I do think that the series will get better. I really enjoyed this, I enjoyed the characters, but the mystery wasn't quite for me. We're stepping back in time slightly further now and I read an absolute children's classic that I have been meaning to read for ages. I saw it on my shelf one day and I thought, you know what? 
Today's a day, I'm going to read it. It is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. This Penguin English Library edition publishes both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass in the same edition, so I read both of those. And once I had embraced the absurd, the nonsense part of the story, I actually really enjoyed it. I don't think that this is one of my favourite books, but the interesting thing about reading it for me was going, why did this speak to so many people at the time that it was published. How is it that this is a book and a story that has remained in people's imaginations for generations? Of course, these days, when you speak of Alice in Wonderland, a lot of people will think of the Disney adaptation, which I certainly watched as a child. But in going back to the original text, the thing that I tried to do as I was reading this was to throw off the parts of adulthood that I think restrict your imagination and to try to read this book through the lens of a child, to see these things happening, to believe them, to believe the absurd and also just to let your imagination run wild. I think there's a real lesson in there. I can't decide if I enjoyed Alice's Adventures in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass more. I think there were elements of both that I enjoyed. I enjoyed the concept of Through the Looking Glass, this idea that you look in the mirror and there is a mirror world on the other side and everything is kind of back to front. I loved that. There were other parts of the book that I kind of glanced over and I didn't really feel totally engaged with. So I, I just don't know if this is fully my thing, but I'm so glad that I read it and I think I will go back to it um, and think about it a lot more. I think it might hold up more on a second reading because I do think there was a lot that on a first reading you miss and I didn't feel like I could fully get into the complexities of the wordplay and things like that. So I enjoyed Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. It's not my favourite children's classic, I don't think I'll be reading it anytime soon again, but certainly at some point in the future, because it is a fantastic story that has played such a huge part in our cultural references. So worth a read, but try to read it through the lens of a child rather than the way that as adults, we try to make sense of everything. This isn't a book that you can really make sense of or should make sense of. I then read another book I have been meaning to read for ages and it was The Awakening by Kate Chopin, which was published in 1899. And I think that my issue with this book when I was reading it is that a lot of the framing around it, particularly in the way that this edition was published by Vintage Classics, a lot of it was framed as this illicit affair between Edna, our main character who is a mother, a wife, and is very much seen as a mother and a wife first and foremost rather than a person. It was seen as an affair between her and this younger man that she meets while the family are on holiday. And actually, if you read it as this illicit affair, you'll be really disappointed. Actually, that doesn't really happen in the book or is so inconsequential. I don't really know how anyone could think that that was the main thing you should take away from this book. The Awakening is about a woman who has been restricted in her role as wife and mother, who has done the right thing and taken on a role, but in the process has forgotten who she is and what she wants and has also been caught up in what society wants and what society expects from her. And so the book is about her escaping from the birdcage that she has been placed in, not really physically, but more mentally. And there was a particular instance I liked, this highlighting in the book of how her husband, Edna's husband, has provided for her external existence, but in the process, her internal existence has been forgotten. And so he never quite sees her for who she really is. He sees her for who he wants her to be. And I think those are the most powerful moments in the book. There were a few things, however, that didn't quite work for me. I feel like this could have been taken further. So I know that it was published in 1899 and people were horrified when it was published because of feminist beliefs and the things that it was advocating for. 
But when you read this alongside some earlier novels, particularly some of the Victorian novels, I actually didn't think that it went far enough or was extreme enough. I think it could have gone further and further, not so much the ending, but just the in-between, all the bits in the middle. It never quite felt like I was blown away by it. It never quite reached the heights that I wanted it to reach and I felt like it could have been even more radical but on the other hand I think that's fair enough but sometimes what is radical is those quiet moments so I'm still a little bit conflicted about what exactly I wanted from this book I think the framing was off I think the way that it's talked about doesn't quite sit with what the book actually delivers and this isn't a book about plot which I think as readers we can often think a book needs a plot but actually if you take away any mention of the plot in this book it works <laughs> but as a story the story is about Edna and about her internal life rather than the external events of the book. I would definitely recommend it and I would love to know if you've read it what you think of it. I just wanted so much more and that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it because I did enjoy it but I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting for something huge to happen. So this is definitely not a book that I have finished with. I'm still pondering it, still thinking it over. It hasn't quite left me. I feel a little bit haunted by it to be honest. Another jump forward in time, the final book that I read was The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories by Angela Carter. Again a book that I've had on my bookshelf for ages and I just thought now was the right time to read especially in the run-up to Halloween because these are spooky horrifying terrifying stories but at the same time there were so many moments that made me laugh and I love the contrast between the horrifying and the hilarious. This short story collection reimagines the fairy tales that we all know and love. So it starts with the tale of Bluebeard, a man who has killed his previous wives. And we of course have a new wife at the start of this story who is our main character who I just want to tell if a man has had four or five previous wives who have all died or disappeared under mysterious circumstances, maybe you shouldn't marry him. <laughs> that was just what I wanted to tell her, like from girl to girl, maybe don't marry this man. It's a bit suspicious to me. We also have plays on Beauty and the Beast and a vampire story which I really enjoyed um, and a lot of the books are about a feminist telling of the story but not always in the most obvious way. This is a book that as I was reading it I was constantly thinking about it and trying to work out almost the puzzle to get to the root of Angela Carter's meaning because there were so many layers to the stories not just because they are stories that we know but because her take on them didn't always go in the expected way. The collection is dark but at the same time very sensual and I think embraces is female sexuality and female choices and actually some of the most powerful moments in these stories for me was at times where you questioned the radicalism of some of the endings or some of the choices that the characters make but I feel like what Angela Carter was trying to say was that sometimes the most empowering decisions for a woman to make are those that she has made herself and in her interests regardless of how we view them or whether they are the most radical decision actually if we make them ourselves that in itself is powerful it's what we have chosen my favorite stories in this were the bloody chamber and also angela carter's take on puss in boots which made me laugh so much there were so many moments where i just had to stop reading because i was laughing which was such a contrast to other moments in the book and i definitely want to read some more angela carter short stories soon i'm so happy that i read this i didn't think it was going to be my thing but actually I enjoyed it so much more than I expected. What a collection of books. I'm so happy that I got to read all of these and I've discovered some new favourite authors. I've gone back to favourite authors and I've rediscovered again why I love them so much. To me there is nothing like reading a classic and just to be constantly thinking about it even when you're not reading it. To be working it out in your mind like a puzzle. To get to the root of what an author was feeling and doing 
happening and to feel the power of the characters' emotions at the same time as they are going through what they're going through. I loved it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comments what you have been reading lately or if you've read any of these, I'd love to know what you thought of them. Happy reading!